Okay, so we'll we'll start. Uh, we'll start. We'll recommence once again, and it's my pleasure to introduce Daryl Molendorf, who's professor of international political theory and philosophy at the Goethe University in Frankfurt. Great. Over to you. Thank you. Uh, let me begin first of all by thanking Jeremy for the invitation. It's it's a great uh, honor to be here, and it's started out to be a very interesting conference, so I'm looking forward to hearing the rest of the talks. Also to thank Jeremy and Simon for their organization. I know it's a big job to put put on a, a conference such as this, so I appreciate your efforts. Am I not, am I not close enough? Good. Okay, so um, the let me say something about the title of the talk before I get into the talk. The, the, the question that I ask in the title, I ask honestly, um, and I I ask it in a certain sort of pessimistic turn of mind. Um, the pessimism has to do both with uh, the what I take to be the course of climate change negotiations and the, the relative lack of ambition that we've seen with respect to mitigation efforts thus far and the projections for those that will be coming out of Paris. And also with respect to what people like me, um, that is moral and political philosophers, have been doing for the last several years working on climate change. I've been working on these issues for about nine years. And one of the things that strikes me is that, um, that our efforts haven't had a whole lot of impact. And um, that's, um, there's something a bit depressing about that. And um, that is part of the, um, Part of the background, I guess, that leads me to ask the question in the paper. The other thing to notice, of course, is that the word justice isn't in the topic. And I'll be interested in a normative issue. Um, and the normative issue is the, is the normative issue of dangerous climate change, which I take to be fundamentally a normative issue. But I take it to be a, a normative issue that is, um, oh, I, take, I take the avoidance of danger to be a much less ambitious goal than the construction of a just climate regime. So if, if you think I'm, I, I'm possibly somewhat, am, uh, somewhat pessimistic about whether or not we can avoid dangerous climate change, and I suppose I'm even less pessimistic, or even more pessimistic, I should say, even less optimistic about the, about the possibilities of constructing a just climate regime. Um, there's nothing particularly to be said for pessimism uh, in its favor, um, so I don't, uh, I don't say that um, uh, with any sense of, uh, of, uh, of being happy about it or encouraging you necessarily to be pessimistic. So as you all know, the, the, the second article of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change uh, says that the, uh, the ultimate objective of the convention is to prevent anthropogenic, dangerous anthropogenic interference in the climate system. I'm interested in what that means. I'm interested in what dangerous anthropogenic interference in the climate uh, system would be. I've spoken about this uh, at some length in a book that I wrote recently that came out last year. And what I'm going to do in the first part of the talk is just say a little bit about what I said, a little, give a little bit of a summary uh, with respect to what I uh, wrote in that book. What I'm interested in is a identificatory account of danger and, or dangerous climate change in particular. So I'm going to talk about that in the first part of the talk. I'm going to talk about the problem of collective action problems and the extent to which they explain the lack of mitigation ambition. I'm going to talk about the promise and what I take to be the central limitation of the pledge and review um, policy instrument. And then in light of all of that, I'm going to give a sort of provisional argument in favor of geoengineering as a response to climate change. Okay, so first with respect to the notion of danger. The, the second article of the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change urges us, or urges the parties to the convention to avoid dangerous climate change. And I take the notion of avoidance there to be central to the concept or the conception of danger that's being used in the passage. So I take danger in that passage to be fundamentally normative. That is to say that climate change is dangerous is to say that we have a reason to avoid it. It's action guiding in that sense. So there are many efforts to, to try to give an account of what counts as dangerous climate change that look simply at accumulations of risks, for example, that risks accumulate after uh, 
1.5 degrees, after 2 degrees, after 3 degrees, and so on. And I think the problem with these accounts of danger when it comes to climate change is that it, they don't give us any particular reason to avoid the danger. Um, when we're looking at danger um, in our personal lives, when we say a course of action is dangerous or when we say it's too risky, fundamentally what we seem to be saying is that given what we value, that's not a course of, a, of action that we have reason to pursue. So if you take a, a personal analogy, if you're interested in going mountain climbing and you're interested in climbing 3,000 meter mountains and you're of a certain age, you might decide that it makes sense to go to a doctor before you uh, engage in the strenuous activity of climbing the mountain. The doctor can give you a full physical report and tell you what the likely risks are for you to climb the, uh, a certain series of 3,000 meter mountains. But what the doctor can't tell you to do is whether or the doctor can't tell you whether or not you should climb the mountains, whether you should avoid climbing the mountains or whether you should engage in the activity. And that's because the doctor doesn't understand, doesn't have a sense of what the values are that are at stake for you. You make that decision in light of the values that you have and you make it on the basis of being presumably an autonomous agent who weighs certain values such as health against adventure, against the aesthetic enjoyment that would be um, that would be had by climbing the mountains, the sense of accomplishment, all of these sorts of things will be weighed against whatever the health risks are. That's fundamentally on the individual level a normative decision. So <clears throat> the idea then is that, that the judgment that something is dangerous, at least in this context of climate change where it's particularly noted that what we're seeking to do is avoid danger, the judgment that something is dangerous involves taking there to be a compelling reason to avoid doing it. Right, it's taking there to be then a normative reason. Now the question is what sort of reason is going to count in these kinds of cases? So if you think about the example that I just gave you, it's a very idealized example, right? It's an example of a, one person making a decision on the basis of weighing health risks against say adventure risks or aesthetic enjoyment. So we have, the, uh, we have in that sort of case the model of an autonomous decider and we have the decider making the decision on the basis of essentially prudential considerations. Of course there could be moral considerations, I don't want to rule that out in the example. It could be that he has obligations to his family or to others but essentially at least as I've described it, it's a prudential decision made by an autonomous um, actor. And so the reasons in that case are essentially prudential and the the standpoint is the standpoint of autonomy. But that's not going to work in the case of climate change, right? Climate change affects the well-being of billions of people, not just the well-being of a single person. Um, so it's not, going to, it's not going to work to say that the, the reasons at stake are essentially prudential reasons. And it's clearly not the case that it's the standpoint that we should be thinking about uh, the decision being made from is the standpoint of an autonomous decision maker. So, which reasons and which standpoint is relevant. So um, let's talk about reasons first. So the reasons for mitigation, I think they're familiar to all of us. When we think about climate change, it's very easy to think about what kinds of reasons we have to mitigate. Um, these are the reasons that people in the mid-range and distant future have to avoid exposure to climate change risks and uncertainties. As it turns out, um, what we'll see when we watch the news in the coming years is climate change occurring primarily as a problem of global justice. We will see poor people in poor communities suffering from heat waves. We'll see them being inundated from seas. We'll see droughts. We'll see tropical storms. We'll see crop, uh, crop yield reductions. All of these provide us with reasons to mitigate, good reasons to mitigate climate change. But they're not the only reasons that are at stake with respect to the climate change debate, and this is what makes it a difficult question, I think. There are also serious, seriously important moral reasons for consuming energy. These are reasons that current people have to avoid restrictions on consumption of inexpensive energy for purposes of human development. Inexpensive energy is very important to human development. And there's a second set of reasons. These are reasons that people in the mid-range and distant future would have that restrictions on consumption, which hinder poverty eradicating human development, be avoided now. Right? The more people that are able to be pulled out of poverty or to pull themselves out of poverty now, the fewer people um, that will be born as their offspring in the future uh, into poverty. So the, the, the goal of poverty eradication affects not only present generations, but also future generations who without poverty 
the efforts at poverty eradication would be born into poverty. I take these to be very important reasons, and I want to give you a couple of examples um, to illustrate the importance. So the first is China. From 1981 to 2001, 400 million fewer people were living in poverty in China over the course of those 20 years. The poverty rate fell from something like 53% to 8% of the population during the course of those 20 years. As it turns out, that was accompanied by and presumably causally implicated by that fall in poverty was a tremendous increase in the use of energy, in particular fossil fuels. So the total uh, emissions of CO2 in 1981 were um, 1,439 million metric tons. In 2001, it was, it was doubled, more than doubled to three, over 3,000 million metric tons. Per capita emissions increases um, were also quite strong. So what we see from that example is poverty eradication tends to be extremely energy intensive and it tends to use, as it, given the kinds of economies that we have right now, it tends to use a great deal of fossil fuels, it tends to emit a lot of CO2. Now, not everybody likes this, the, the World Bank's poverty measure. I don't want to hang my case on the World Bank's poverty measure, so let's give another example. South Korea. In 1980, the Human Development Index of South Korea was 0.63. It was about like the human development level of Panama. By 2001, 31 years later, it was about equivalent to Iceland. It had moved to almost the very top of the Human Development Index. But over the course of that period of time, total emissions increased tremendously from 131 million metric tons to 650 million metric tons. Per capita emissions also increased fourfold. So the lesson from both of these examples is that if we care about poverty eradication, if we care about human development, we need to care about access to low cost sources of energy. You can generalize this account. This is, uh, this is an account, um, this isn't a very clear or um, easily read graphic, but on the vertical line, we have the human development index. It moves from zero to one being the highest. The human development index, I'm sure most of you are familiar with, this is an index that the, human, the UN's human development program uses. And it's a composite index of, uh, that includes um, indices that measure access to education, health outcomes, and per capita um, income. One is the best, and then the International Energy uh, Agency has developed an energy development index, and it's also a composite index. It, it includes four indices, but, it, it, but essentially what it measures is individual and company access to modern uses of fuels. And what you see, and they've, and they've set up the index so that, it, um, so that it parallels the human development index with one being the highest, the most energy advanced, most access to modern uses of fuel, both in, ho both in homes and in firms, and zero being the lowest. And what you see is a remarkable correlation between the development and use of modern energy fuels and an advancements in human development. So this is all reason to think that the reasons for consumption are important moral reasons. Insofar as we care about poverty eradication, insofar as we care about human development, we need to care about these reasons for consumption. So we have then two categories of reasons, reasons for mitigation and reasons for consumption. If we were thinking about the model of an autonomous individual agent, we would say the individual agent has to weigh these values and decide which are the most important values, give weights to the values, and make a decision on the basis of these. But that's not the model that we have. We don't have an individual, an autonomous individual agent who's making these decisions. So what shall we use as the model for decision making to adjudicate the reasons? One way to ask this, um, if you're a philosopher, is to ask if there's a reason that satisfies what Derek Parfit calls the unanimity condition. Namely, is there uh, a reason that everyone would have sufficient reason to affirm? That is, is there a reason that could, um, in the face of this apparent conflict of reasons, is there a reason that everyone could have sufficient reason to affirm? Both those who are worried about 
mitigation and those who are worried about consumption. Well, from what standpoint would we adjudicate that reason? From which, what, what standpoint we, would we, sorry, would we adjudicate the reason such that we might be able to find a reason that everyone would have reason to affirm? I want to suggest to you that um, the standpoint that we should use is a standpoint that's familiar in international law and um, to some extent also in international questions of international morality and global justice. This comes from the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. All human beings are born free and equal in dignity and rights. They are endowed with reason and conscience and should act towards one another in a spirit of brotherhood. So I want to suggest to you that the reason that we should, or the standpoint that we should use is the standpoint of human dignity, respect for human dignity is what we should be concerned about when we're adjudicating these reasons. So we have, we have to have an interpretation of the standpoint of dignity. What, is, what would the standpoint of dignity be that we, um, such that we could use it to adjudicate between these categories of reasons? I'll suggest to you that the standpoint of dignity involves respecting one another as co-authors of the rules of our common life. To recognize the equal inherent dignity of one another is to take one another, to take, uh, to take others as co-authors of the rules of our common life together. That's an important part of what it means to respect the human dignity of others. So if that's the standpoint um, that we should use to adjudicate the reasons, how can we move forward? Well, um, the, the notion that I'm working towards here is a kind of constructivist notion of, um, of what's going to be involved in adjudicating these reasons. And I'm going to say that there's no imposition, that there should be no imposition of rules that can be reasonably rejected, right? If what we're concerned about is uh, uh, seeing one another as co-authors of rules of our common life, then we shouldn't impose rules on others that can be reasonably rejected. And then it's noteworthy that everybody has reason to avoid involuntary poverty, given what we know about poverty. Not everybody has reason to avoid poverty. There are people who, for religious reasons, take a vow of poverty but everybody has reason to avoid involuntary poverty. And I'd like to be ecumenical at this point about what I mean by poverty, or maybe, um, maybe ecumenical isn't the right word to use. I'd like to be um, indeterminate about it. Um, I think that uh, clearly it's, it would be helpful to have a, uh, a common understanding of what we mean by poverty. And I think that there's been a lot of work that's been done lately, and it's work that I, that I admire. And, um, and pos positively disposed to with respect to coming up with a multi-dimensional understanding of poverty, but, um, but it's not work that I'm involved in and it's not work that, um, that I can speak, with, speak about with any sort of authority at all. So this suggests then a principle to, um, to reconcile the, the reasons of mitigation and the reasons of consumption, and the principle I call the anti-poverty principle that policies and institutions should not impose avoidable costs of climate change or climate change policy on the global poor. So it's important to think about this as a choice between climate change and climate change policy, just like we have the choice between climbing the mountain or not. When we think about what's dangerous, we think about it with respect to options. And if it's a case that everybody has reasons to avoid uh, involuntary poverty, then the option um, with respect to climate change and climate change policy is the extent to which either impose avoidable costs on the global poor. What do I mean by avoidable? Well, I'm assuming at this point that there are a range of policy options that are being taken seriously. And I'm not going to tell you which policy options should be taken seriously. I'm assuming that they're out there and, and for, uh, on, on the basis of other grounds we have them and that we take them seriously. And when, then when we look at them, what we want to look at them, uh, we want to, the, the thing that we want to look at is the extent to which they impose avoidable costs on the global poor. And I should say, when those costs make the prospects for a po poverty eradication worse than they would be absent them. So that's, those are the kinds of costs that I'm interested in. So this is a principle that's meant to identify danger. It's not meant to be a principle of global justice. It's meant to be a principle that identifies danger. Remember the idea is that danger is normative. 
that when we, uh, when we refer to a policy as dangerous, we're saying we have reason to avoid that policy. And the question is, what kinds of policies in, the, in this international or global context could we agree upon as being those that would be dangerous? We should be able to agree that those policies that lay avoidable costs on the global poor are dangerous. What do I mean by avoidable? I mean there are other policies that wouldn't lay those costs on the global poor. That's what I mean by avoidable. So climate change and climate change policy is dangerous insofar as it violates this anti-poverty principle. So you'll see, although the, the, the topic here isn't a topic of justice, it's a, it's, a, it's a question that is fundamentally a normative question. When we seek to identify climate change, when we seek to avoid climate change, we're engaged in a normative, uh, the, the, the very identification of climate change is a normative process and the avoidance of climate change is, uh, is moral activity. All right, so this account of dangerous climate change is unfamiliar, no doubt to you, and probably a bit odd. What does it have to do with the standard account? By standard, I mean the account that seems to be discussed the most, namely that what we should seek to avoid is warming beyond two, uh, two degrees centigrade. This, is, uh, this has now been adopted by the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, and it was advocated by civil society movements for many years before it was finally adopted. So how does this account of danger uh, connect with that? You can see that I, that I would have some criticisms with respect to this, um, to this idea because to, there's nothing particularly normative about identifying uh, climate change as dangerous at the two degree limit. That's just a number. So how does my account relate to that? Well, we all know, of course, that two degrees, if you look at that graph, two degrees um, is a temperature increase along a spectrum and that there are risks of climate change well below two degrees, serious risks associated with climate change and serious risks associated with climate change afterwards. Um, so if you look at that graph, there doesn't, two degrees doesn't sort of jump out at you as, uh, as, as particularly risky. What, what one might say with respect to two degrees is um, that if we're worried about risk accumulation, we would think that the lower the, the, um, the, the, the climate change increase, the better. So there are prima facie reasons to reduce risks, the risks of climate change on anti-poverty grounds. There's prima facie reasons to want the temperature to be low because the impact of climate, uh, climate change, John talked about this uh, in the previous discussion, is going to fall very heavily on the poor. But the threshold of risk accumulation is judged by the anti-poverty principle in light of poverty eradication efforts. So um, what that means is that insofar as climate change policy is expensive, and insofar as the expenses might fall on the poor, then the threshold of a risk accumulation is going to have to be judged in light of that. And it may be that certain activities uh, would limit temperature increase but lay the costs of doing so on the poor and therefore violate the anti-poverty principle. So if, if uh, certain policies lead to an increase in the, uh, in the price of fuel, and if the increase in the price of fuel tends to retard human development or poverty eradication, um, then we may take the risk accumulation associated with increasing warming as uh, being less of a, a worry than the, the threat of prolonging poverty eradication. So, but if there's a temperature limit of less than two degrees that could be maintained without constraining human development, then it's possible that the two degree goal is just simply too high, right? This is the way we think about this with respect to the anti-poverty principle. If we could limit warming to say 1.5 degrees without constraining human development, then clearly the anti-poverty principle would enjoin us to do that. Alternatively, if maintaining the two degree limit requires something like a global recession, then two degrees is probably too low. So in the discussions with respect to climate change right now, there is, um, there is a, a, a line of thought Kevin Anderson has this view that we need, to, um, we need to engage in policies of degrowth. This is made popular um, by Naomi Klein to some extent. What, what degrowth means is essentially recessionary policies in the industrialized, country, in industrialized countries. But of course the problem with recessionary policies in industrialized countries is they don't stay there. 
they go to the developing world. Recessions transmit to the developing world. We've seen very clear um, examples of this with the, with the last great recession. Um, so we, um, this is a table from the, from the World Bank of net capital inflows to the developing world. Um, and the, what I'm interested in here primarily is, I don't know if, well, maybe the problem was I, the batteries weren't any good in this. That might have been the problem. So what I'm interested in is the column at 2007. It's uh, the, the column almost all the way to the right. Uh, and comparing that to the column 2009. And you can see that there was a tremendous uh, loss of inflow of capital uh, to the developing world between 2007 and 2009. The recession that started um, as a financial crisis in the United States quickly spread to a recession throughout the world, and it was very damaging um, throughout the world. Recessions don't, um, recessions of that, uh, of that size in major industrialized countries have a way of traveling. There are, tran there are crisis transmission mechanisms that, uh, that transmit them. So if it were the case that in order to meet the two degree limit, we had to engage in degrowth policies in industrialized countries that produce recessions there, the likelihood is that these would, these would harm the poor um, very significantly in the developing world. And from the perspective of the anti-poverty principle, that would be a good reason not to engage in that kind of a policy. All right, so I've talked a little bit about what dangerous climate change is and um, what the uh, what the consequences are of taking this anti-poverty principle uh, seriously for judging whether or not climate change is dangerous. I want to go on to talk about why it is that we've seemed to make such little progress with respect to mitigating climate change, that is with respect to um, thwarting um, dangerous climate change. And then I'll talk a little bit about the direction we seem to be going on with respect to pledge and review. So. Uh, there's a well-known analysis of what the problem of international negotiations is with respect to climate change, and the analysis takes it to be that there's a tragedy of commons kind of problem. The general structure of which is that a stable climate system is a, is a global common good. Um, most, if not all, states would enjoy uh, maintaining the status quo of a global stable climate system. And, uh, but although all states have reasons to see it preserved, or almost all states have reasons to see it preserved, probably uh, beyond a certain threshold of warming, we can say that all states uh, have reasons to see it preserved. In a competitive international context, each state also has a reason not to assume the costs of mitigating climate change. And this leads to um, the well-known tragedy of commons circumstance. Now, people who, um, who discuss these kinds of cases will say, well, what you need is some sort of authority that, in the language of game theory, changes the payoffs, as it were. Um, so what, what's needed um, is an international authority that can hold states accountable, that can raise the costs of not participating. So the essential practical problem, and the practical problem from this perspective that we're engaged in, is the construction of that authority and building conf confidence to construct that authority. Now it's aggravated, um, and I think this is correct, um, by several factors. It's ag and this is uh, just drawing on the work of international relations theorists, so a well-known article in the field. Um, in this particular article, what they're interested in trying to explain is why it is that we seem to have something like what they call a regime complex and not a comprehensive treaty. Um, but that explanation is essentially the explanation of uh, a, a sort of finely grained, more detailed explanation of the tragedy of commons. Um, and um, they, they discuss five aggravating factors. That there's a wide distribution of interests in mitigating. Some states have much greater interests in mitigating than others. Um, that there's uncertainty about the risks of non-involvement, what might uh, happen if states don't involve. And there's uncertainty about the benefits of involvement because there's uncertainties in the climate system itself, right? There's um, uncertainties that go back to the, the notion of climate sensitivity, how much warming we can expect from a doubling of CO2 in the atmosphere. There's a range of uncertainty about that um, in, the, in the orthodox climate science. And on the basis of that uncertainty, then there's, a, there's, there's cascading uncertainties with respect to how much precipitation we should, um, we should expect with how much uh, sea level uh, increase we should expect. So these sorts of uncertainties affect states' enthusiasm or their interests in being involved. 
insufficient productive linkages between parties. So there's, um, there, we haven't done a particularly good job up to this point to motivate states to act in accordance with uh, a climate change mitigation regime in a way that would encourage some states to act who um, might seem to have less of a reason to act than others. There's a diversity of problems of climate change. Climate change is in part a problem of warming. It's also a part a problem of sea level rise. It's also in part a problem, a big part of the problem is access to inexpensive energy. These sorts of this diversity of problems just augments the problem of reaching an agreement. Poor states, developing states, for good reason, don't want to enter into a climate change mitigation treaty that's going to limit their access to uh, cheap and inexpensive energy. It's a serious problem if you're from the United States, like I am, you understand this acutely, of domestic political difficulties. You might have um, people who want to uh, agree upon, you might have negotiators who want to agree upon a robust climate change treaty but these treaties have to be brought back to the countries, and in the countries they have to be, uh, they have to be um, if it's a democratic country, uh, typically the treaties have to be voted on before they can go into force. And uh, if you have a populace that um, tends to be in the grips of climate change denial, then that makes it very difficult to negotiate a robust treaty, even if you wanted to uh, negotiate a robust treaty. So these are fa factors that aggravate then this political problem or this, uh, this moral slash political problem of the tragedy of commons. That's not the only analysis of the collective action problem that, um, that, that is meant to explain the problem of weak mitigation. Most of you are probably familiar with a different analysis by Stephen Gardner um, who talks about not the, doesn't talk, uh, he, he takes it to be uh, the case that we have a tragedy of commons that's uh, a collective action problem uh, with respect to agents that exist at the same time, na namely states existing now. But he takes it also to be the case that there's another collective action problem that's an intergenerational problem, intergenerational buck passing, um, he sometimes refers to it. He gives it, uh, he gives it more than one name. So according to Gardner, the, uh, this collective action problem arises because the benefits of mitigation accrue mostly to future generations, right? and they'll accrue for a long time into the future. But the costs of mitigation accrue mostly to present generations. The problem being that there's no means by which future generations can hold present generations accountable. There's no means by which future generations can impose those costs on present generations. So Gardner claims that this is the real global warming tragedy, he says at one point. And the real global warming tragedy is the problem that future generations bear the costs, uh, sorry, the future generations uh, will experience the benefits, but present generations will bear the costs. And insofar as we think simply in terms of self-regarding uh, concerns, we've been unwilling to, uh, to bear those costs. Now, I think the claim that this is the real global warming tragedy is ambiguous. Um, and I think its plausibility is a bit unclear because of the ambiguity. So one way to read that this is the real global warming tragedy is to say that this is the tragedy, this is the collective action problem that's the hardest to deal with. It's the hardest to deal with because there doesn't seem to be an institutional mechanism by which future generations can hold present generations accountable because future generations aren't here to do the work. Right? So it seems to be more intractable. And if that's what the claim is, then it strikes me that there is a great deal of plausibility with respect to the claim. But there's another way of reading the claim, and I think that Gardner probably means this as well. And this way of reading it is to say that this collective action problem has more explanatory power. It does a better job of explaining why mitigation has been so, efforts to mitigate have been so weak. And if that's what he means, I think it's less plausible. I think if that's what he means, in effect what we're doing is comparing arguments to the best explanation. We're comparing the argument of the tragedy of commons, the explanatory power of that argument against the argument of international buck passing. Which argument has more explanatory power? 
then we have to ask ourselves which, which analysis explains the phenomena. They both seem to give us an account of why it is that parties would not be engaged in mitigation very substantially. Uh, but we also have to ask ourselves whether or not one explanation explains too much. If it were the case that the explanation were the correct one, would it be explaining too much? And here I think that there may be a problem with respect to Gardner's analysis. Because if we take this analysis as, um, as it stands, at least on the face of it, it's hard to understand how we've made any progress at all with respect to climate change mitigation. And we have made some progress, we just haven't made very much. If the problem is as, ac as acute as he claims it to be, then one would doubt that we could make any progress whatsoever. So I'm a bit worried that Gardner's account explains too much. And in that regard, then, even if it is the more acute problem, the hardest problem to fix, it's not as clear that it's the problem that we should worry the most about because it's not as clear that it's doing the right or the proper amount of explanatory work. All right, but be that as it may, um, that's an aside that I'll, I'll come back to in a moment. Be that as it may, then um, it's an interesting to look at what the institutional responses might be if we're in the grips of these kinds of collective action problems. People who take the collective action problem of the tragedy of commons seriously oftentimes argue, one of the uh, authors, David Victor, of the analysis that I discussed above, um, makes this argument, argue for a club model. The idea of a club model is to begin with a small coalition of the willing, of the states who are willing. And this is a way of averting the tragedy of commons because you start with states who are on board already, right? So you don't have the kind of need to, um, to uh, try to negotiate amongst people who are already suspicious with one another. And from the coalition of the willing, you try to establish incentives for other states to join in, to ascend to some sort of agreement. So Victor has in mind something like the, the, the model that was used to develop the World Trade Organization. Over a long period of time, um, by, by states ascending to the World Trade Organization, you got broader and broader um, participation in the treaty. So the thought is to start with a treaty that is deep, goes after deep emissions reductions early on, but is not very broad, and then to bring more states in by creative institutional mechanisms, giving them an interest in which they have an interest to actually be part of this treaty. Uh, as I said, all, along the lines of something like the construction of the World Trade Organization. Notice that this is a model that might respond adequately to the, um, to the problem of the tragedy of commons by starting with those who are willing and then trying to develop an institutional incentives to bring others on board. But it doesn't respond very well to what is a fundamental problem with respect to climate change mitigation, which is the problem of urgency. Given that we continue to increase emissions globally, we haven't even begun to stabilize them, let, uh, let alone uh, reduce them, the problem of reducing emissions is a very urgent one. And what Victor's model suggests is a very long-term process. If you think about trade negotiations, it took decades before the, um, before the World Trade Organization arose out of the, out of the GATT. So, it doesn't seem to be a very good response to the tragedy of commons if, um, if the problem uh, also involves a problem of urgency. This is reason, I think, to worry that um, mitigation um, may not, mitigation efforts may not um, be able to um, be adequate um, to the problem of climate change if we take seriously the, um, the problem of the tragedy of commons. Gardner has recently proposed an institutional response to what he takes to be the, to the global uh, buck passing problem. And it's a, it's a response that involves establishing a global constitutional convention. And at this convention, the aim of the convention would be to establish a global constitutional system. And the system would represent the interests of future generations. Um, now, it's a very sketchy proposal. It doesn't say very much about um, about, about how it would work, but presumably if it's going to represent the interests of future generations in a way that's adequate to the problem, it's going to have to have some coercive power. It's going to have to have the power to coerce states now in the present 
on the name of future, gen in the name of future generations. That is, provide some disincentives to emitting CO2 um, and uh, other greenhouse gases. And the disincentives presumably will have some coercive force. That may well be the kind of solution that's needed if you take seriously the, uh, the intergenerational buck passing problem. But again, here I think we're faced with very severe practical problems of the construction of this kind of an agency. States are going to fiercely resist this. Maybe in the end they'll lose that battle, and maybe in the end they should lose that battle, and maybe many of us will be activists in the battle hoping that they lose it, but it's not going to come soon. Um, and that's just, that is to suggest that it's not going to respond very well to the problem of urgency. States are not going to give up that kind of sovereignty over their energy policy in the name of some international authority um, very easily. So I think if we take seriously both of these problems, both of these collective action problems, and I think there's probably reason to take more seriously the, um, the, um, the problem of the tragedy of the commons than Gardner's proposal, and of course that would be good news insofar as that's the easier one to solve, but in either case, if you take seriously either one of these problems, it looks like the problem of climate change mitigation is a very difficult one to solve. Um, it's a very difficult one to solve institutionally and in light of the urgency of climate mitigation. There isn't any particular reason to be optimistic that mitigation is uh, power, uh, uh, deep mitigation is going to be forthcoming very soon. All right, that's rather pessimistic and rather depressing. What's actually happening now? What's happening now, of course, is neither what Victor proposes nor what Gardner proposes. How am I on time? Ten minutes? Okay, I'll speed up. Um, what's happening now is something called pledge and review. Um, and this is what uh, the, the policy that we expect to come out of Paris um, this year, at the end of this year, is a policy that's going to involve states making voluntary pledges to reduce their CO2 emissions um, over a period of time. And uh, these are going to be folded in, we hope, into some sort of international agreement that will, um, that will produce a package of total emissions. So the, the, the key virtues of this kind of a policy is um, that it promises wide international participation because states participate on a voluntary basis. They don't have any strong reason not to participate, so presumably many states will. And it's looking as if that will be the case. Moreover, because these are voluntary reductions, um, there will not be any coercion that's exercised on poor and developing countries by rich, powerful developing countries. So the development interests of poor and developing countries will be preserved by this policy. That's, I think, very important. Both of these are important. But I think uh, it's, um, it would not be correct to expect that in light of the collective action problems, we're going to see deep mitigation that will arise out of a voluntary process like this. And indeed, the initial pledges suggest that that won't be the case. So if you look at the previous pledges from Cancun, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change says that these are not likely to keep um, uh, warming below uh, two degrees, but uh, possibly below three degrees. And the forecasts, the forecasts that, uh, from people who've been doing the forecasting work recently, suggests that the pledges that we've seen so far are not going to keep warming below two degrees, that we're going to have substantially, uh, a substantially warmer climate. And of course, all of this would make sense on either of the analyses, whether the analysis is the analysis of the tragedy of commons or the buck passing uh, analysis. We should expect this out of a policy that, uh, uh, that's being developed in this sort of a way. So the, the, the thought is then it seems very unlikely that we're going to have robust mitigation if what we care about is the way in which climate change is going to affect the global poor, then we have reason to care very, um, um, uh, very much about the, the failure to mitigate that's, um, that we um, have reason to expect as a result of the Paris um, meeting. So this leads me then to consider an alternative possibility. I want to suggest to you a pro tanto, a conditional argument in defense of Geoengineering. Geo geoengineering, um, of course, is a term that covers lots of different things. Um, and it covers, in particular, two categories of things, carbon dioxide removal and solar radiation management. I'm actually most interested in the latter, the solar radiation management. Um, and these are, um, these are a host of policies that, are, that have been proposed to uh, 
try to limit um, the radiative forcing of anthropogenic emissions of uh, greenhouse gases, not by slowing the emissions in and of themselves, but by reflecting the solar radiation of the sun back into space. So here's an argument that, um, that I'll suggest to you. Avoiding dangerous climate change requires arresting anthropogenic temperature increase constrained by not hindering human development, okay? So that's simply the work of the anti-poverty principle there, that what we're interested in is both arresting temperature increase and um, not hindering human development. Collective action problems diminish what can be reasonably expected in this regard by means of mitigation. Perhaps the analyses that I've given you, they're not my analyses, but they're analyses that, I, that, I, that I'm very impressed with. Perhaps those analyses are wrong, but if they're not wrong, then, um, then we have reason to think that, um, that the, uh, the collective action problems are, are severe. Carbon dioxide removal and solar radiation management may be means of supplementing mitigation. Supplementing mitigation here is, is, um, is important. I don't mean to offer this as an alternative. Supplementing mitigation to arrest temperature increase with acceptable moral costs. That may be the case. Right? I'm not claiming that it is the case. I'll say something about supplementing. Well, let me say something about it right now. So when I, when I talk about supplementing mitigation, I'm thinking about proposals that have been made, for example, recently by David Keith. Um, I think he's the person who's done the most work in this area. Uh, and he's asked us to consider most recently a proposal that would use solar radiation management not to try to address all of the radiative forcing caused by anthropogenic emissions of, of greenhouse gases, but to use it as a partial response. So he suggests, and a, and a response that would be dialed down over time as mitigation ambition increases. So he suggests um, trying to address, try, trying to uh, offset half of the rate of radiative forcing caused by greenhouse gases by means of solar radiation management. As the rate of increase declines because mitigation ambition increases, then the amount that we would, the amount of solar radiation management that we would use would be decreased. When he talks about solar radiative man management, what he means essentially is, is shooting sulfate aerosols into the stratosphere. Right, that's, the, that's his proposal. If there may be means with acceptable moral costs of supplementing mitigation to avoid harming the poor, these should be robustly researched for possible deployment. Carbon dioxide removal and solar, solar radiation management should be robustly researched for possible deployment. So this is an argument in defense of robust research into these areas um, with the idea that this research may issue ultimately in the deployment of these technologies. Um, it's an argument that's made on the basis of taking seriously the anti-poverty principle and it's an argument that suggests that the use of these kinds of technologies may be temporary and um, should be temporary and um, should be dialed down over time. I don't mean to suggest that this argument settles the debate by any means, um, by any means. If you look at um, the, um, the, the way the argument is formed, it says that these may be means with, with acceptable moral costs. We will only know whether the debate is settled, I think, by additional research. So some of the most important moral considerations requiring deployment concern its side effects. This is one of the reasons why we need additional research. Of course, those aren't the only important moral considerations, um, and you may want to talk about some of the others in the discussion period. Are there other moral concerns that would strongly oppose research or deployment? Some are worried that if you engage in robust research, you'll diminish uh, the incentive to mitigate. That's a, sometimes referred to as the moral hazard problem. Some people wor worry that deployment of these kinds of technologies is a kind of hubris or a kind of domination of nature. And then, of course, there are massive governance considerations. One of the main attract attractions of, this, uh, of these technologies, at least the solar radi radiation management, is that it's inexpensive. And the very fact that it's inexpensive leads to serious worries that governments may want to use it in a way that, um, that, that's not consistent with the wishes of international society. So imagine the alliance of small island states deciding that, the, that, that, that climate change is an existential threat to them. Um, and that the only way that they can remain um, alive is to begin a robust process of, of the deployment of, of, of sulfate aerosols into the stratosphere. It would probably be feasible, e economically feasible, for them to do this. 
but it raises serious governance problems. It may be that the rest of the world is not ready for that or will have very serious um, worries about what the consequences of doing that would be. So the governance concerns I take very seriously, and I don't think we're anywhere near the point of knowing how we might solve them. Uh, we need to give a lot of attention to that. Okay, that's my talk. Thank you. Thank you very much. Daryl, who would like to begin the discussion there to your right, Simon? Thank you very much, Daryl. Um, that was very interesting. I have two questions, one for the more or less beginning of the paper and one uh, for what you say towards the end. So uh, you consider the anti-poverty principle because you think it's a reason which everybody can share. Mm -hmm. um, however, you didn't consider any other reasons we all might share, right. especially if you put in involuntary, right? That makes right. a big change. We right. always say we all have reason to avoid involuntary harm. That right. makes it much more tricky to say what actually falls under that. So I was just wondering whether you could say more about possible alternatives and how that affects your argument. Yeah. Um, and towards the end, uh, I was a bit surprised uh, in the bit on geoengineering that you didn't talk about uncertainty more, right? And connected to that moral urgency. So if moral urgency is a major concern in the case of uh, Victor's proposal for a club of the willing to start with mm -hmm. them, mm -hmm. surely it's a major concern for geoengineering. Uh, what David Keith says is all nice and well, but we're miles away from being able to carry out geoengineering in terms of SRM, uh, stratospheric aerosol injection in any kind of responsible way because we don't have enough research, uh, because we don't know enough about the effects it would have, and because testing it actually is extremely difficult because you can only do it on a global scale. You can't do it locally. So doesn't that really affect the plausibility, since you earlier talked about plausibility of the geoengineering option? with regard to yeah, SRM. Good. So with, um, with respect to the first question, uh, it, it's, a, it's a good point and it's a good question. I, I'm, I raise the, the question of poverty because I'm just assuming that there's a sort of dialectic in the background. The dialectic is the, the, glo the global dialogue about, um, about the worries with respect to uh, climate change mitigation, namely that there are developing countries that are fiercely concerned and appropriately concerned that an international climate change mitigation treaty is going to make it much harder for them to achieve their national development ambitions. Um, I think that's uh, a concern that we should appreciate. It's a concern that we should understand and that we should in, uh, in fact endorse. Um, and given that that's the dialectic um, in the background, then I think it's easy to zero in on the problem of involuntary poverty. But of course, there's a, a, any other, you know, there's, there's a host of pr possible principles that could be picked out. I pick out that principle because I, I assume a certain background political dialectic. Um, so that's, that's where it comes from. Uh, with respect to uncertainty and um, solar radiation management, I, of course, I am a, aware of the major uncertainties. And I, I ask the questions about whether or not solar radiation management would lead to regional droughts and whether or not it would lead to ozone depletion. And asking the questions, I meant to flag the, the uncertainty with respect to those things. Um, and I think that they're serious uncertainties. Um, the, the, the technical deployment of solar radiation management is not a problem. I mean, we have, we have the technology now, apparently at least. I'm no, I'm no engineer and I'm no student of this technology. I, it's just, this is just on the basis of what I read. Um, so to say that we're, um, we're a long ways away from it, I think is true, but it's not that we're a long ways away from it because we don't have the technology. We do. We're a long ways away from it because we don't know what the impact of the use of it would be and whether we would want to use it if all we're concerned about is the consequences. We might not only be concerned about that. We might be worried about hubris. We might be worried about the domination of nature. But if all we're concerned about are the side effects uh, uh, of the use, the unintended consequences, we're not there. This is, I think, a reason for, for engaging in serious and robust research to find out whether or not um, these are concerns that we should be uh, worried about. And um, my understanding of this, and um, again, this is not an expert understanding of this, is that um, the way that testing 
proceeds with matters like this is, first of all, by means of computer modeling, second of all, by means of limited field tests, and then third, by means of, a, of something more like, something, something like a global test, but not a full-scale commitment to it. So I, um, my understanding is that there, there can be limited field tests with respect to this. Um, and it's important also to realize that there have been natural tests. Um, so when Mount Pinatubo uh, exploded um, in the Philippines um, a while back, it injected a bunch of sulfur into the atmosphere, and the result of that was uh, mild cooling of the planet. Of course, the um, doing this by means of, uh, by technological means would be very different because we would be injecting it into the stratosphere and we would be injecting aerosols into the stratosphere. So it's not as if that test would be in any way, I mean, the natural tests that we've seen are in any way um, perfect with respect to uh, what's being proposed with respect to the technology. But it gives us reason to think um, that this is, I, I think, worth further exploration. Remember, of course, I mean, this is against the background, and I guess I, I want to stress this. This is against the background that climate change is going to be disastrous to the poor and that it doesn't look like we're going to solve that problem, at least if you take the collective action problem seriously. So if I'm, these are the two premises of the argument. I mean, you, you, can, you can resist those premises and fight them if you want, and we could talk about that. But I think if you take those, those premises <laughs> seriously, the, the sorts of risks associated with thinking about doing this kind of research and, the, and possible deployment um, seem like risks we may want to bear. And really quickly come back to that. Sure, just very quickly. Yep. Um, so at the end of the day, then it's more a lesser evil argument in a certain yeah. way, right? Um, and for the meantime, you would just say, until we find out what we can do, we go with pledge and review or see whatever, whoever else is, is there, possibly even a club of the willing, and we just see what works faster. Yeah, I mean, it seems like the, the direction we're headed down uh, is the pledge and review direction. Um, and of course, you know, the, 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 the hope with pledge and review is that ambition will be ramped up over time, right? Um, that we'll start with something that's wholly inadequate coming out of, uh, of Paris in December, and that over time, trust will be built and um, that it will become more adequate. And, Perhaps that will be um, the case, and it, you know, I think we should all hope that that will be the case. In the meantime, I think we should be engaged in research on solar radiation management. So, so there's a lot of questions, so first, and then John. Um, hello? Okay. So um, the driver, so in there you were talking about a, a driver that somehow was going to encourage further interest in mitigation later and therefore we should do these things now. So um, you had, your analysis seemed to uh, focus on states as actors and fossil fuels as important for development. And so there's been a lot of um, analysis on the environmental Kutznitz curve, Kutznitz, and showing that, in fact, um, you know, there, it's a technological change thing, and you don't necessarily need the same technology in the future to arrive at a development level that you did in the past. Um, states own the majority of um, uh, fossil fuel rights, and uh, Extraction companies uh, are interna multinational extraction companies are large and and have more resources than many states. So it might be interesting to look at um, the political economy between states and large companies, and particularly large companies as actors, and how technology can evolve rather than fossil fuel use evolving. Um, yeah, because it, it companies also, and they, so you can look at it through supply chains and which, what kind of drivers and leverage they have as opposed to states. So that, that might be a, a good way forward. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so uh, certainly what we need is a, is a technological transition and um, any, any climate change policy should be directed towards facilitating that and encouraging it and incentivizing it. And I, I mean, one, one of the advantages of, of putting a price on carbon, however you do it, is um, to facil facilitate that technological transition by, by raising the comparative 
price of fossil fuels vis-a-vis uh, -vis these um, vis -a -vis renewable energy forms. And of course, you need to do that with proper attention to, the atten uh, to what the consequences of that would be to the poor. So you need to think about what the institutional means um, could be that would insulate the poor from, uh, from that. And that's, I think, seriously important. Um, I think the political economy of the problem um, uh, gives us reason to be um, sober about the prospects of um, rapid and deep uh, mitigation of climate change because of the power of, fossil, of the fossil fuel industry and the power that exists over the political process. In some states more than others, but in the United States, the coal lobby is a powerful lobby. Um, I think that uh, the, the political economy of the problem suggests that um, states, although states negotiate climate change mitigation treaties, they're not fully in power uh, with respect to their economic policy. Um, their economic policy oftentimes is driven by powerful interests within the country. So this is just another aspect of the problem that I think makes the, um, the, um, the, the tragedy of the commons even more acute. It's just very difficult for states to deliver on on very deep mitigation promises, promises because they have powerful oil lobbies in their countries that um, that they have to contend with. Uh, John, uh, yeah, it's a couple of questions. <clears throat> first, the first one is just uh, in defence of my colleague Kevin Anderson, <laughs> right? Who's also a good friend, so. <laughs> Wasn't a personal attack. No, 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 it's not. No, it's not. But no, but I've talked to him a lot about it. Yes. I mean, it's, I mean, what, I've, and I've been involved in some of the discussions around degrowth in Leipzig and so yep. on. I mean, taking your first premise about the day, you know, he was facing future dangerous climate change. I mean, Kevin's, Kevin's partly coming from his climate models, which says the way we're going at the moment, dangerous in your sense of producing mm -hmm. very, we're talking about three, four degrees mm -hmm. or even. Yes. Right is not going to happen. It's not even the other three unless we have very clear reductions now. And I, th I think the challenge he's putting forward is he's saying as a, as a scientist, right, the, o the only thing that's happened that's produced lower emissions has been recessions, right? I think he would accept that recessions have been disastrous for the poor. So he's, yeah. not, so he's not arguing for right. a recession. So, th so I think the challenge is, and I think this is a challenge, and I think we need to think about it, is how we have equitable degrowth, right, which doesn't involve the kind of problems that you have raised about poverty, uh, poverty in the poor. And, I, and then when you look at your early figures about Korea, yeah, you're talking about going from Panama, which is, 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 a, is you know, is really, it's, it's talking about high poverty, to Iceland, mm -hmm. which is above, you know, we're talking about lower thresholds, yeah. but we can start talking about upper thresholds as well, is above any threshold that you would need to, to alleviate poverty. So the, the question is, is where the thresholds are to, in, to get that kind of equitable degrowth. So I think equitable degrowth, if I'm honest, is the only game in town mm -hmm. eventually. But that's it. So that's the first, first question, yeah. yeah, right. Second one is just on the geoengineering. And I was involved in the Royal Society report yeah. on that and yes. doing the ethics of it. The a couple of things on it, I mean, just, just one minor technical point and then my major worry with your argument. Yeah. The minor technical point is you didn't mention uh, ocean acidification. Yes. Right. And ocean none of the solar radiation methods will address that. And ocean acidification right. is clearly going to have a big impact on those communities that rely on um, fishing and, and, yep. and sea. That's right. But, but the second, the bigger worry I had was the, the idea, in terms of the internal structure of the argument, was the idea that it could be temporary, right? Because you've got given lots and lots of reasons for being pessimistic about an agreement, mm -hmm. right? Those reasons wouldn't go away. <laughs> yeah, so, so you've, you've given no reasons for thinking that your temporary solution wouldn't be a permanent solution. So I think appealing, given your premises, to a temporary mm. uh, solution, it doesn't, doesn't seem to work given, your, mm -hmm. given what you've mm -hmm. said. Yeah. So, right. so, the, so the real question is, is would you be happy with permanent right. geoengineering? And, I, and my problem then is I don't think it's feasible permanently. Mm 
And if removed, especially solar radiation methods, you're going to get a heat spike, which would, which would be much worse, actually, than gradual, the, the gradual temperature increases. So, it, so I'm not convinced, given your premises, that the kind of uh, temporary solution is possible. Mm -hmm. Good. So there's yeah. three questions there, I yeah. think, or yeah. three thoughts there. One is degrowth, the other is ocean acidification, and the other is the, the yes. temporary yeah. nature. Yeah. Right. Um, so, look, I mean, in, in the global economy that we live in, taking it as it exists now, um, I don't understand what equ equitable degrowth would look like. Um, so if, let's look at the way in which the, the recession was transmitted to the developing countries in 2009. There were three main factors that occurred. One was there was a tremendous disinvestment. Foreign, foreign direct investment just dropped off tremendously because there was less capital available in, in, uh, in uh, advanced industrialized countries um, to lend. Secondly, there was a tremendous drop off of remittances. So all of these people who moved to the United States, moved to Great Britain, moved to Germany to work, and they were sending money back to the countries that they came from, there was a tremendous drop in what they sent, and that really affected the incomes of these countries dramatically. And then third, there was a tremendous loss of, uh, of market for basic exports, the countries that are importing the, um, the basic raw materials um, in, the, in the industrialized world Drop, drop their import uh, in, imports tremendously. So all of this had a, a, a huge effect on developing and underdeveloped countries. I don't understand how you're going to have a, a loss of income in the industrialized world that's not going to produce these effects as long as we live in an integrated global market and an integrated global financial market. I don't understand how you're not going to have these effects, how, how the recession isn't going to going to spread to the developing world. Um, I'd be interested in seeing um, a plan that addressed those issues. And if there was such a plan, then, then perhaps that's where we should cast our, our hopes. But then you've got the other problem. And I think this is something that I haven't addressed. But I think the, the political problem of trying to convince a populace of an industrialized country to vote for recession is tremendous. It's a tremendous political problem if we if we're operating within a democratic uh, uh, political framework. I can't imagine a party getting elected saying you're going, to be better, you're going to be worse off three years from now than you are today. It's just very difficult to imagine that occurring. But possibly, possibly it could occur. Um, but all of these are just reasons, I think, to be skeptical about the, 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 the degrowth um, um, perspective. And I find it odd that it's somehow a, a perspective that's been adopted by the left. It strikes me as... There's nothing particularly left-wing, as far as I can tell, about it. Um, so um, I'm puzzled about that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think part of the reason why it has been adopted by the left is precisely the, your response to the first question. It, it, it gives us reason to question the kind of global political economy that we that yeah. we do it do live in. So yeah. I think. So I, yeah. I, mean, I guess I just yeah. have different so, so it's convictions. Some, yeah. My left-wing yeah. convictions are that I'm, I'm worried about human development, I'm worried about poverty, and I want to see institutions that, um, that, um, that pull people out of poverty, not institutions that, that tend to make the problem of poverty um, worse. With respect to acidification, of course you're right. I mean, when, when, the, when, I, when I talked about the, um, the possible uh, dangers of, of solar radiation management, I didn't talk about ocean acidification precisely because that's a problem of climate change. Right? I mean, it's not a problem caused by solar radiation management. It's a problem with climate change itself. But you're right to note that solar radiation management isn't going to fix that problem. It's not, it's not a cure-all by any means. Um, that's why I don't think it's an alternative to mitigation. Um, I think that it's, um, it's something that we might use to, um, to supplement mitigation in a period in which we seem to have weak mitigation ambition, which takes me to your last um, question, which is whether or not um, we could ever stop using it, particularly if the um, if the the problems of collective action are as serious as I take them to be. I think it depends upon which problem you think is driving the uh, which collective action problem you think is driving the process. If you take Gardner seriously, then it's hard to see how we're ever going to develop any kind of mitigation ambition. Um, if, on the other hand, you take it to be a um, a a tragedy of commons approach, well, we've solved 
tragedy of commons all the time. It just takes time and it takes trust building. And I take international, the international negotiations to be a process of doing that, that is trying to build the trust um, that over time will produce a, I hope, um, a, a more robust climate change mitigation treaty. And I think if you develop the policy of solar radiation management um, explicitly linking it in a way, I mean, this is a sort of, I think, the really attractive feature of Keith's proposal, that is linking it um, to the rate of increase of radiative forcing caused by anthropogenic uh, uh, um, greenhouse gas emissions, then as that rate of radiative forcing decreases, then the amount of solar radiation that you're licensed to use will also, radiation management that you're licensed to use will decrease as well. Then you have built into the policy the, the extinction of the policy. But of course, all of that requires a tremendous amount of governance that we, um, that we may have reason to doubt um, we have the means to achieve since we don't do a very good job of cooperating internationally to solve problems. Uh, Fergus, in the middle, yeah. So. Thanks. So uh, <clears throat> I, don't, I don't take any issue with the anti-poverty principle. I thought you could develop that quite well as a sort of minimal principle, and I, I quite like that. Um, but I wanted to take issue with a few of the, or at least give an alternative perspective on a few of the empirical yeah. assumptions, which I think do affect the overall argument. So first of all, um, and maybe I'm reading too much into this, but I, I, you sort of seem to be saying that there are necessarily quite significant adverse human development impacts from mitigation action. And um, I mean, a lot of the most interesting work in the economics of climate change over the last few, really two years um, in particular, has really, I think, started to kind of destroy that assumption um, for a few reasons. One is about the, the rapidly declining costs of substitutes um, and an understanding of the reasons why that happens that give us good confidence that they're going to continue to decline over time with the right policies in place. Um, and second is a, a greater understanding of the sort of full social costs and benefits even in an, in an economic sense, if you want to monetize them, however problematic they may be, if we're operating in this framework. Um, need to take those into, into account. And so there are huge social costs to high carbon energy within countries, even ignoring climate change and, and vice versa for, for low carbon energy. And when you actually put all of these things together, and um, I've tried to do this in a working paper and just drawing on what other, others have done, the, you know, I think there's a pretty strong case that actually most of the mitigation, actually, mitigation action that's needed could be done in a way that is nationally net beneficial. Now then you have distributional issues, right. absolutely, right. But, but importantly, and, and this is where I think it's important for the discussion of collective action, if, that, if that's right, and it's debated, yeah. right. if that's right, it's, it suggests that it, it, it knocks out the basic premise on, on which we say there's a tragedy of the commons, because you say, putting aside climate change, if, if countries are, you know, um, uh, sort of efficiency maximizes, then which is what tragedy of the commons assumes, then there shouldn't really be a collective action problem. Countries should be mm -hmm. acting anyway in their own economic self-interest. Um, so, so I, I mean, I personally think that whilst there are some international, there are some sectors and issues that do have an international sort of prisoner's dilemma kind of structure. A lot of mitigation actions, particularly in the energy sector, are going to be nationally net beneficial. And so then the obvious response is, well, what? So why why don't we see action? And there, I think it's sort of Victor's fifth point is about, and you raised it too, about the domestic political economy. Yeah. I mean, I think that is by that has by far the most explanatory mm -hmm. power, mm -hmm. um, and that my argument is that's where we need to be to be looking. So, the, so the sort of the collective action problems are th there to some extent, but sort of secondary. So that's kind of another level at which I would sort of call call that into question. And then, then the final point, which is slightly disconnected, is. Uh, I, I query kind of your, your move from the, the pessimism about the gap implicit in existing pledges for, towards Paris um, and therefore saying so that's your sort of pessimism necessarily stemming from that therefore we need to move to geoengineering. I think that move is too quick um, and I think the main reason you alluded to people saying that there are reasons we could accelerate more quickly afterwards. But I think you dismissed that too quickly. I mean, I think there are good, very good reasons why we could ramp up quite quickly. And actually, there's been a lot of ramping up already in the last few years. I think there are a lot of non-linearities and kind of 
um, exponential functions in a lot of what we need to do on mitigation. And actually the paper you cited, Boyd et al, that's Boyd, Stern and Ward, who yes. are my colleagues. And yes, that's right. we have other papers right. which say, yes, there's likely to be a gap, but yep. we think there's really good reasons for accelerating yep. afterwards and, yep. and things like that. So they're my comments. Yep. But that's all welcome news. Thank you. And I'd, I'd love to see your working paper if you wouldn't mind sending yeah. it to me. My email address is, is there. Thank you. Yeah, like um, so, uh, yeah, look, I, I, I certainly don't mean to be arguing that human development is necessarily um, uh, connected to uh, uh, massive greenhouse gas emissions. Of, of course, the, the project is exactly to turn the technology towards renewable energy, right? And that, that's what we need to do. The worry is whether or not you can do this in a way that doesn't increase the costs of human development. And this is why your, um, the work that you're doing sounds so interesting and is so important. Um, and of course, it is the case that renewable energy, the, the levelized cost of, uh, of, of, of energy generated by renewable sources seems to be dropping. Now, whether or not it continues to drop and whether it will drop in, the, in, in, in a course of time that leads to robust, uh, the possibility of robust mitigation, I guess, is the open question. But we, we should all hope for that, by, by all means, it seems to me. Um, and I'd like to see the evidence to, uh, that would give me a, a little bit more hope uh, with respect to that. I don't mean to suggest that, um, with respect to the second part of your question, I don't mean to suggest that um, that because what's going to come out of Paris, I think what's reasonably predicted to come out of Paris is going to be insufficient, that it can't be, that it's not the case that this might not ramp up over time. That's the, that's the best hope of the, di of the diplomacy, is that we're going to get something entirely uh, inadequate right now, but that it's going to be the first step or maybe the third or fourth step in a, in a, in a building of trust that's going to lead to, uh, uh, to, more, um, to a more robust uh, a set of commitments in the future, particularly if, it, if it's met with the kind of dynamic that you're talking about with falling energy prices. That's reason to hope. Um, what I don't think we should be doing, however, is throwing all of our, as it were, policy eggs into that basket. I mean, I think it makes sense simultaneously with respect to um, uh, casting hope in that direction to, to be engaged in a robust um, research strategy with respect to solar radiation management um, to find out whether or not we have more than one way to, um, to address this problem. Um, uh, Larry, down, down the back there. Hi, yeah, thanks. That was a very provocative uh, talk. Most of my questions have already been asked, actually. It's a bit like being telepathic in this room. Um, but the way, um, you know, you, you presented your, your, your talk of uh, the only way to lift people out of poverty is through capitalist economic growth based upon fossil fuels. Uh, there's um, sound Marxist credentials for that view, right? Well, that's... Uh, <laughs> The, the, you know there has has been a rise in GDP that is perhaps the, the end the end you know the lifting people out of poverty um, but you know I mean other people have said that that's not the only way human development can increase there can be other technical systems other economic systems other technical economic assemblages where the quality of human life could be increased without increasing fossil fuels, but then pragmatically you point to the huge obstacles in creating that political economic change. So it necessitates then that leap. They're also quite unpalatable and difficult and risky thing of contemplating geoengineering. But it's just to kind of really to take a step back and reflect on kind of where we are really in, you know, in the culture. Like a hundred years ago, the political discourse was, of course, there can be a different economic system. And now it seems we've naturalized the economic system while we quite happily talk about re-engineering the climate system. We're in exactly at a time where the, the current zeitgeist for the past 20 years has been that it's hubristic to talk about interfering in markets because they're sacred and mysterious and they just have to let run their natural course. But now we can intervene in, in climate systems 
as if that isn't mysterious or unruly or, you know, we, we have denaturalized the climate while we've naturalized the market. And, and whilst you might be uh, correct in your pessimism about the ability to, to change capitalism, it's at least to kind of point in any talk that there is that alternative there, even though that's probably more difficult than geoengineering. But just a, a last thing, the very framing of geoengineering suggests something precise, like engineering, which of course uh, it isn't. So I mean, it is a form of it is a form of engineering. I mean, that's it, it, the, the problem. Of course, is that it doesn't have the kind of precision precision that you would want it to have if you were going to employ it on a planetary scale um, right now. Um, and I take that that's that's the sort of the the worry that's behind your last formulation. Um, Look, I don't, um, I don't mean to be suggesting some sort of deep commitment to the capitalist economy um, or, the, um, uh, or, or, or to the use of, uh, of the market as a just distribution. I, I, I don't think the market uh, distributes um, justly by any means, and I don't have any commitment to capitalism, quite, actually quite the contrary. Um, but, um, but I do think that if, if, if you think the problem is capitalism, um, that's a problem that we're not going to solve uh, with respect to the urgency, uh, in, given, given the urgency of climate change. It's not a problem that we're going to solve in time to get a grip on climate change mitigation. So um, we better uh, be thinking about other, um, other ways to address the problem. And um, I think... I don't mean to be claiming, making a conceptual claim about the relationship between human development and the use of fossil fuels. It's not conceptual. Um, I'm just looking at experience. It's an empirical claim, and it may be an empirical claim that we'll have we'll have reason to um, to reject ultimately if it's if it's the case that renewables become cheap enough. But recent history suggests recent history. Um, the last 30 years, suggests that the way to pull people out of poverty and to promote human development is to use a whole bunch of energy. There's no other way to do that, it seems. And that, of course, makes a certain amount of sense. I mean, you can do armchair sociology to understand that. What you might not need, however, to expend all of this energy is the use of fossil fuels. And that, the hope, of course, is that we can make that kind of technological transition. Um, that's my hope, and um, if there's a post-capitalist society, we'll, we'll, need to, we'll need to do that. Um, I'm, I'm conscious that there are other questions, um, and, uh, but I'm also conscious that we, we have a time constraint. So could, could I ask that people do ask those questions um, in the event tomorrow, or, or indeed at the, uh, at the Town Hall Hotel, uh, at, at the Hotel de Ville, um, this afternoon? And um, in the meantime, could we thank Daryl very much for his wonderful paper? Thank you. So, so the event starts again at, at 2 p.m. Sorry? 2.30.